Okay. Well, welcome to those who are joining us uh, for our Modern Slavery uh, series, Unchaining Modern Slavery series. It's, we're really pleased that you've been able to join us uh, uh, today. Uh, we're mindful it's probably been a big week for everybody. Uh, there's always a lot going on, so we really value uh, your time with us today. My name is Dr. Stephen Morse. I'm the CEO of Unchained Solutions. Unchained inspires Australian organisations to be leaders in making an impact on modern slavery. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Recognize that people are joining us from many places, even overseas. And uh, yeah, today I'm speaking from Garigal country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, Unchained acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And we pay respect uh, to elders past, present and emerging. And we extend all that respect uh, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. So Unchained hosts these webinars with a view to advancing the conversation on the issue of modern slavery, recognizing that it's a complex issue and that modern slavery exists on a continuum. And there's a lot for us to consider uh, as from different angles and different lenses. And really that's as Unchained in interviews different people, uh, we wanna get different perspectives uh, from you know, different sectors on different industries uh, and different methodologies and tools uh, that people are using. All this goes into helping companies and organizations who uh, need to comply with the Australian Modern Slavery Act to go deeper in their implementation. And in our own words, to lead beyond compliance, to find pathways to not just tick a box, uh, but to have a real impact uh, in this space. And so as we, as we gather today, uh, we, we invite you to participate, uh, to, to ask questions. You can put your questions in the chat. We hopefully will answer at least some of those questions in the time that we have today. And if not, we can always uh, most happy to respond in emails. Uh, and you're also uh, welcome to reach out to us uh, following this webinar. Well, today I have uh, with me uh, Kelly Beaker, and you can reveal yourself now, Kelly. Ta da! Hola. <laughs> Kelly uh, is uh, dialing in all the way from Mexico City. Uh, so it's uh, not the first time we've had someone from overseas, uh, but uh, but we're glad that you've been able to join us for at least from the maybe the first, no, the second person from the Americas. So Kelly is the co-founder and executive director of the Cannabis Education Guild, uh, which is based in Canada. Uh, Kelly is a global uh, social impact leader and speaker and educator at conferences, universities and community groups for cannabis and its use in, um, in medicine and in other industries uh, using cannabis and hemp. Uh, Kelly is also a member, uh, like Unchained, of the Commonwealth 8.7 Network. And this is the global movement of NGOs, educators and consultants who are working together to fight modern slavery and human trafficking within the Commonwealth of Nations. Mm -hmm. And so it's great to see, um, yeah, there's a global movement. Um, there are lots of global movements, but this is one global movement. So Kelly, um, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, Thank you for having me. That's our so pleasure. Really exciting to connect with people like you, Stephen, who are doing such wonderful things um, for the, the business world to learn about modern slavery. So I'm honored to be here. Perfect. Great. Well, look, Kelly, perhaps um, you could spend some time just introducing yourself. I've just got a little blurb, but uh, maybe if you could introduce yourself, um, the different kind of hats that you might wear, uh, your background, and what brings you to be in uh, a big city like Mexico City. Uh, so I'm Kelly Becker, and I'm from Toronto, and that's where the Cannabis Education Guild is based out of, but I'm currently in Mexico City. I've been working in the cannabis industry for seven years now uh, with some of the largest licensed producers in Canada, and uh, now my focus with the guild is on education. There's a vast need for it um, in all markets, whatever stage they're at, and a larger discussion around how we can prevent modern slavery from entering this new supply chain. And it's really exciting, and we'll dive into it more, I'm sure. But you know, this is the infancy of a sector, so all of your you know, past learnings from, you know, other industries, Stephen, we can apply that in advance to this new uh, growing industry. 
Great. Yeah. Well, it seems like it is a growing industry. I mean, it was only legalized here for medicinal use, I think, back in 2016 in Australia. So mm -hmm. it's an, it is a new area, certainly for me. I'm quite green when it comes to uh, the, uh, what, uh, the use of uh, cannabis and what, it, you know, and the different ways that it is used. But uh, in my discussions with you, there's obviously, it's, there's different types of uses. So I'm very intrigued. And I think it will find it very helpful because it's not just about uh, therapy, it's not just for therapy, uh, therapy use, there's quite uh, an application. So, um, yeah, I suppose just in terms of uh, your background and what brings you to, I suppose, this area, what's the backstory uh, for you to come into this space? Great question. Uh, my background was in um, a lot of global and social impact work in Asia. So I'd seen cannabis growing wildly there. When I returned to Canada, the medical market was just booming and I started working with a licensed producer there. And when, you know, Australia legalized and we were having conversations to expand there and then, you know, Thailand and Mexico, I saw this global impact this plant was going to have. And so that's why I ultimately, you know, wanted to go out on my own and start this kind of movement to educate all kinds of stakeholders, not only commercial, government, uh, medical professionals, you know, public at large, there's such a big stigma, but more so that larger kind of ethical supply chain conversation, which, you know, I thought was especially important in these new Asian markets. So, uh, yeah, that's how the two worlds kind of have collided. And um, it really excites me because, you know, Canada is a great example, but there's a lot that other countries can learn from us uh, in what we did wrong. And so sharing those key learnings can save people you know, millions of dollars, but also um, an opportunity to embed new best practices. Right. So, I mean, I suppose maybe just for those who don't know, how is, you know, a product like cannabis used? Um, what are the different uh, ways in which this product is being used in a legal sense? Um, that's a great question. So I actually have a few slides. I don't know if you want me to share them, like just to go through like the cannabis industry a little bit. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, please do. Yeah, that's one of we can jump there. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Just because I think if everyone gets a visual of the magnitude of what this industry has the capability to become, um, then they'll be on the same page as us in seeing the risk uh, as this could be the next cash crop that's really ripe for exploitation. So I'll just, uh, yeah, give it a share. And Stephen, jump in with comments and questions, please, as we okay. go along. Okay. So not many people realize that cannabis is not only the most used drug in the world, it's also the most cultivated drug. It's grown in 151 countries that doesn't exist with any other agricultural crop that doesn't exist with any other illicit drug. So it's operating now in the legal and the illicit space and it can grow you know, in most climates. It really will be one of the, the next cash crops. I think it traded like in the next decade at least. It's significance is because of the range of products that will will go through um, but as you know more than anyone the global trend of legalization is not only at a critical point in time so is modern slavery and anyone who's listened to you and your series knows that these are numbers that are actually quite out of date shocking numbers that came out from the International Labor Organization, I think in 2014 and haven't yet to be updated. Yeah. But if 70% of the risk is really in agriculture, we need to see cannabis as the next agricultural crop. And as we know, this is also old data, but no country uh, is free of modern slavery. It exists in every corner of the world in every supply chain and Asia Pacific being the highest. But really, the why cannabis, why now urgency for me is the multiple reasons like this is nothing new. We've always had a global cannabis industry. We've always had trade, global trade products being developed and distributed and now in straddling both illegal and underground market. So it's something that was you know, entirely native to Australia until the 1925 Geneva Convention. Cannabis was used there as a main cash crop. 
And now for over 70 years, we've seen it be pushed to the underground market. And this has created huge problems with illicit trade, which also ties into the vast problem of human trafficking. But as Stephen mentioned, in Australia, the laws have changed and over 50 countries in the past 10 years have amended their cannabis legislation in some form or another. Um, some have just decriminalized it, which is a huge step for countries like the Philippines or Malaysia that are still hanging people for cannabis possession. So we are seeing some really positive changes. The UN was a huge catalyst um, in 2020. They removed CBD from the list of narcotics so that then propelled a lot of countries to change their legislation. And we're seeing projections like that are getting higher and higher every year that maybe the global market will be at 90 billion by 2027. And to your question, Stephen, there's not only this idea of drug use cannabis, there are 25,000 different products that can be made from cannabis. Cannabis and hemp are the same species. They're sister plants. Yep. But cannabis is still hemp, and in many countries, hemp is still un illegal, unfortunately, even though it has so many different uses. So we need to think of this um, sector as a mega disruptor. It's coming in and it's disrupting wellness, industrial, medical, and adult use markets. In the adult use market, um, we've already seen billions invested specifically from big alcohol and big tobacco because you know, in, in countries like Canada and, and places like California that have legalized cannabis, we're seeing a dramatic drop in alcohol consumption. So these companies are following the trends and they're investing billions. So we need to think of cannabis now as this, this consumer package good, not just, you know, a drug that we think of in a Ziploc bag. Sure. In Australia, specifically fashion, when it comes to hemp has taken off, these are all Australian brands. Um, and they're really good examples. If you look up these companies, they're very transparent in how they're using hemp, where they're sourcing it from. Um, she actually, I forget her name, Lydia, she's some Olympic, uh, ex-Olympian who started her own hemp line. And so the movement has definitely spread in fashion when it comes to um, hemp in Australia. And, as we know, if we think of any other commodities, the threats of a commodity, commoditizing is that we're not thinking about people. We're thinking about the bottom line. We're thinking about margins. Mm. And we all know that if we can buy a $5 shirt from Zara or a $1 coffee, somebody's not getting paid. And the same risk exists in cannabis. And working for some of these large companies and seeing their investor relations decks they were saying, you know, if we grow in Canada in the U.S., it's going to be $4 a gram to produce indoors. But if we grow in Thailand or Lesotho or South Africa, it'll be $0.10 cents to, gram, to grow per gram. That's nothing. Like that, no, that's, that's how we know people will be exploited. Yes. So right. this is really where the risk comes in. So, yes, thinking of it as this, this consumer packaged good is very important. Um, you know, we know that cheap goods come at the cost of exploitation. These are all recent articles. I'm, you know, really shaming Canada here, but I know Australia has a huge problem when it comes to um, the agricultural sector and migrant workers. But, you know, if we even look last year at PPE, a lot of countries were sourcing from Malaysia where there was yep. so much uh, labor exploitation happening there. Yes, and it was and interesting with, with that, how, you know, the U.S. relaxed its... Uh, is rules and regulations regarding the importation of PPE, um, which um, you know just opens the door then uh, to all forms of exploitation because that once the demand reaches critical levels, um, and it did during and it still, it still is really because of the pandemic, um, you know we then get, it's very easy to turn a blind eye uh, to how products are being made. Exactly. But I did think the exposure that came around it was very good. It was healthy discourse for everybody and yeah. rethinking, you know, supply chains. Uh, I think that was the silver lining. But I'm happy you, you said that about, you know, the critical demand, because this is really what cannabis is about now. Like these, these projections are growing. We're seeing all kinds of products come out, research come out, um, you know, G20 countries, legalized so it's it's going to be a really fast ripple effect over the next decade 
specific to Australia, you know, the, the market right now is at like a $50 million value, but it's expected that once, you know, medical cannabis becomes more widespread and they get closer to legalization, it could be a $1.5 billion market in just, you know, three years time. Companies have spent $62 million on R&D, which, you know, I really admire that that's where the industry is going. Obviously, sometimes their motive is to legalize, but just to see that investment in clinical research is so important for all of the patients. And there are over 60 corporations who are already licensed. So, you know, it's, it's now larger than a small market and it's only going to grow once um, there's adult use products available. And I also thought this was interesting that attitudes are changing and this was already in 2019, but 42% of all Australians thought that, you know, cannabis should be legal. And it seems very evenly spread between the, um, you know, yeah, young yeah, folks yeah. To, to middle age. Yeah. And, and it's even gone up 7% for, for seniors because we're seeing that as the fastest growing consumer segment in Canada right now, all the medical benefits. Okay, right. Um, and another uh, factor when we think about the risks for cannabis and modern slavery is that, like I said, there's always been a supply chain. There are hubs now that are drug trafficking, human trafficking hubs for cannabis, which overlap with legal markets. So how do we ensure those bad practices don't bleed over? In uh, Northern Thailand, Thailand now being the first legal country in um, Southeast Asia, it, wow, the Golden Triangle, Myanmar, that is where there's more um, human trafficking than anywhere else in Asia. And then also the Golden Crescent in South Asia, which is like India and Nepal area. Um, also a number one cannabis hub and where I am in Mexico as well. And Mexico is now medically legal, soon to legalize. So how do we ensure that those people from what we're calling the legacy market, some of them being great growers and the people we've learned from and the people who have pushed legalization, how do you not affiliate with what is, you know, the criminal human trafficking side of cannabis, how it's always been? And I'm sad to share that this is not only happening in the illicit space, it's happening in the legal markets in mm. Canada and up the US and Lesotho. So this is just the beginning. The supply chains have yet to be developed. We're already seeing, you know, human trafficking or, you know, migrant worker exploitation um, and just workplace harassment, terrible things. So do you think with, you know, with the legalization of cannabis, do you think we will see, you know, obviously there's the, with the legalization, hopefully there's the increase in regulation and monitoring um, of production and, and who's actually producing that. But I mean, it's, what is the risk then that the, the illicit side, the, you know, will, will increase as well. And, and therefore there will be a, a, a marked increase in, in, forced labor risk and and the like well it's both sides right like it's the it's a, a grow a demand for a growing workforce in the legal space and haphazardly built supply chains plus a booming illicit market and the risk as well which has um, already been an issue in thailand is that you know migrants will be deceived now to work on a cannabis farm because it's legal there and then end up working, not knowing what is a, a licensed operator should look like and end up working on an illicit um, farm or factory and ending up in jail. So that's even happening in the legal space. Okay, right. I suppose, yeah. So that's, yeah, there's the potential then there to, to be, yeah, be lured or coerced into working somewhere yeah, where it is illegal and then, yeah, being up for... It yeah, being you, unclear, yes. Yeah, being exactly. up, being unclear. Yeah. Um, yeah, so exactly to your point, really it's going to demand a large workforce quickly mm. and um, cheap labor growing in the global south because you can't grow 365 days a year in, in Canada and most of the US, so... This is the risk, and we're already seeing large licensed producers that have overextended themselves 
start to sell their facilities in Denmark and, and other places in Europe because it's way too costly to operate um, for the, uh, the sheer amount of cannabis that's needed, especially for producing like oils, tinctures, you need a, a bulk amount of cannabis to then extract it from. So to think of that all being done indoors is quite costly. Okay, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, this is what excites me to your question earlier. Like mm -hmm. why, you know, why, how did you get here? Why this topic? How do these topics intersect? Um, it's really this idea of a new way of working. So Australia is definitely ahead of Canada, shaming my country again, <laughs> that we don't have a modern slavery act. We have um, put something on the table. I think two senators pushed a bill through in 2020 and it's still not- Still in debate. Yeah, so it's, it's really quite bad and um, I'm, I've read mixed things about how effective Modern Slavery Act is in the UK and as well in Australia, but we don't even have one in place. We don't even have a benchmark or anything to go by. Um, right. So we, we know at a government level, it's not really been entirely effective, whether there's an act in place or not, to really minimize the risk um, in supply chains. So yeah, what it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, go it's ahead. interesting. It's interesting the the way that. Yeah, the, the way in which the, the legislations are, are rolling out. Um, I think in Australia, it's still early days to see, you know, the, the full impact of the, of the modern slavery legislation. It is going into review this year. I know that the UK uh, Act has already been reviewed or is in process as well. Um, so, I mean, what, what are some of the, the, um, the pushbacks, I suppose, from Canada? Is, that, is it just that, that it's not working elsewhere or...? Um, uh the factors i that that's not even what i i haven't even really heard much pushback it's just sort of this looming tabled bill for two years now okay and you know especially when we got caught red-handed with the ppe and we were in Xinjiang, china with the you know uh cotton exploitation happening there and not really taking any stance on either subject I think Canada needs to be put in the spotlight. Like this is an opportunity to actually take a new industry that you're for now temporarily a leader in and do something different and try to embed policy into the Cannabis Act as other countries are following our template. Yeah. We can set a new standard. So it's hard to say, you know, which should come first because we're speaking to all kinds of people in government about you know, putting this directly into the Cannabis Act, a sector first approach to really governing labor protection, or should we just be focused on getting that bill through? But the problem with the draft bill and what I'm sure you would say is the same in Australia is that it governs, you know, companies that are worth 200 million or more, large corporations are the only ones that are, um, required to do any kind of reporting and nobody in the cannabis industry has that kind of money it's it's they're, they're small medium-sized businesses but also they are outsourcing either packaging or cultivation or extraction you know very few companies are actually vertically integrated and doing all of the um the manufacturing themselves so it will become an intertwined murky supply chain quite possibly so it will be different if 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 that piece of legislation passes but can be specific for cannabis as yep. an industry-led approach mm. or you know I, I would love your opinion or anyone in the chat like we don't really we're kind of looking at it as a two-prong focus on just getting the bill through but at the same time we need something that's sector specific because this sector doesn't have that much money right now so uh, we'd welcome any feedback sure Sure. I mean, the, the, it's interesting with the, the legislation here in the, in the sense that we've also have a, an amendment to the Customs Act in Australia, very similar kind of uh, in scope, I think, to what's happened uh, in, America, in the United States um, in terms of banning the importation of goods made by forced labour. So that's gone through our Senate here 
uh, and is uh, due to go into the lower um, lower house uh, later this year um, after the, the federal election that we have coming up this weekend. So that's an interesting piece of legislation change in that, um, you know, on the one hand, we have the Modern Slavery Act, which is asking calling upon companies to do the due diligence to assess and, and identify and then monitor and report and remediate on the risk of modern slavery in their supply chains. And we have another piece of legislation that uh, that is basically, hopefully from that, will then help companies to identify what products they can bring into the country, um, lest they're, they're banned or rejected um, through the customs process. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, from my perspective, it's interesting to see that the way in which the two legislations are, are interplaying. Uh, in the space well it's far more advanced than most countries well that's good i mean from from the feedback that i've seen and and the, what i've read you know the french legislation uh is probably the strongest in terms of what it's asking companies to do uh, not just to report but actually but to actually go to great lengths uh to investigate uh the risks of of forced labor and modern slavery so yeah, there's a lot more writing uh, on the French legislation. So maybe the maybe Canada could look to to France <laughs> uh, for a great for a good example, a great example. Okay, sorry, um, I uh, interrupt you. So yeah, please. No, continue. it's a great point. Lots for me to think about um, and take back to the team. But yes, we believe that you know if there can be something, not only governing cultivation, the soil, the marketing, the packaging, the advertising, but also labor protection. If this was something that was discussed. If this is something that was integrated, it really could be the first sector-based approach because in the past, anything that's been like a an intervention later by government, if we look at chocolate or coffee, and now there's fair trade certifications, none of them actually can guarantee, nor are they financially incentivized or legally incentivized mm -hmm. to have to comply or double, triple check with audits. Right. So this is really an opportunity to try something different. So as, as I said, you know, maybe Australia will do it first, but we think that Canada as the first G20 nation should set a sector president and try to embed some type of so social policy into the regulations. And so we're at this critical moment in time, and I guess I want to turn the question to you, Stephen. How do you think Australia is going to choose to operate? Do you think that there is a chance that maybe things can be done differently, knowing what we know from other industries, especially agriculture? Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the production of cannabis, um, I think I mean Australia has. Um, yeah, there are lots of issues in, in terms of forced labour in, in ag agriculture in general in Australia. And so I think uh, one of the things that Australia needs to do is to really sort out uh, how the agriculture sector uh, operates, uh, particularly when it comes to the, the treatment of uh, seasonal uh, workers, uh, people who come, say, from the South Pacific uh, as uh, low school um, workers to, to, to pick fruit, to work on farms. Um, and we also have uh, an ambivalence towards asylum seekers here uh, in the sense that we have some 95,000 asylum seekers who, yeah, for, for a lot, of, a lot of, of whom are actually quite, quite at risk of being, um, being ex, um, exploited. One of the dynamics, I think, in Australia is that, um, yeah, there is, we do have a, a Fair Work Ombudsman um, who does, uh, they do, do work to investigate uh, issues around, around worker exploitation, but it tends to be focused a lot on uh, wages and wage theft. Um, and uh, one of the dynamics that is, yeah, that we can't seem to get on top of is actually, yeah, targeting, in a sense, the recruiters, those who actually bring people, uh, set up the, the set up the, the work and actually uh, sort of the, the main channel of, of exploitation. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a lot here that we need to do uh, in agriculture generally, um, um, let alone this, uh, this sort of segment, if you like, of, of agriculture uh, in and of itself. I I'm, I'm suppose I'm curious as to know, um, you know, where you know, where the, the main risks are in this sector um, of agriculture um, uh, globally, uh, where would be the, 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 the chief hotspots? 
So as I mentioned, definitely the areas that overlap with these um, hubs. So I would say Southeast Asia, especially Southeast Asia. Northern Thailand, um, Southern Africa, all of Africa, but definitely Southern Africa is moving the fastest with um, legalization. And we're seeing tobacco farms there um, now invest in cannabis and get out of tobacco. So that again, risks the same bad practices from a, from a legal perspective, bleeding into the industry. Um, as well, Mexico is a huge hub, Colombia as well, which has an advanced medical market. They're already exporting to Europe. And Northern California as well is quite bad. They call it the Emerald Triangle, yep. um, both in the illicit and legal space, specifically for migrant workers. And even New Zealand with the Maori population, there's been a few issues there. I not I can't speak at great detail about it, but uh, in my own backyard outside of Toronto, there was issues with one of the largest companies exploiting workers from Mexico, Guatemala, Philippines. So it's it's kind of everywhere. That was a very long-winded way of saying <laughs> everywhere. Yep. I, I also forgot India, which is now legalized in a few states there. Um, and we know labor exploitation is rampant in agriculture, especially in tea. Um, and this will be very similar to the tea industry in India. Yeah. So, so basically everywhere is at risk in my opinion, but I also, I don't mind if I'm hyper over forecasting how bad this could be mm. and then I'm wrong. But if we just look at cocoa or fast fashion or coffee, all of these supply chains that are backpedaling right now, cannabis has this opportunity to actually do something preventative rather than in 10 years needing an intervention. And so it, it's quite um, a new way of thinking, but we've tried so many different things. 8.7 Commonwealth Network, you know, the fact that 8.7 has to be like a sub point, why is ending modern slavery not in its own SDG. It's another conversation, but you know, like we've tried all these different networks, associations through the UN, through different groups and bodies and nothing's really worked. So what if an industry led approach and cannabis being this big disruptor could actually be a catalyst for business at large? Right. Yeah, well, you know, I think, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, I think sometimes we need to speak it out uh, and over, 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 over speak it because there is a lot of noise. And, and I suspect also to a bit of stigma um, sort of showing away uh, from, from this issue, uh, you know, mm -hmm. because, of, because of its um, attachment to um, an illicit trade as well. Um, so, and not being Absolutely. mainstream. So perhaps as the, as the, the use of cannabis hemp, hemp becomes more mainstream. Uh, it just it becomes more front of, of mind as being part of not 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 something which is exceptional, but more actually this is just one product among the picking of fruit, for example. <laughs> no, but really, like think of thinking of it like cotton or yeah, it's like sugar. cotton or yeah, exactly, yeah, sugar like so, an ingredient that's in everything. Yes. Yeah, palm oil, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, exactly. Kind of yeah. exactly. So, so is that really part of then? It, it's just on? like we have to, you, you mentioned the stigma. We have like a lot of learning to do, but also unlearning to do. Yeah. Getting rid of this, you know, conditioning that it's just this drug and this, you know, medicine. It's so much more. Well, I mean, if even just in preparation for this webinar, I was just sharing people what this webinar is going to be about. And, you know, I just sort of made the comment, you know, this is probably the most controversial webinar that I've run uh, in terms of the actual topic. But why? But then why does it have to be so controversial uh, when it's, you know, it's a growing industry, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, uh, and there's so, and such a wide range of usage uh, like other products um, in the ag agriculture sector. So, so we need to start bringing, yeah, thinking of it much more, um, not as something which is an exception, uh, but as really part of part of the entire endeavor. Um, and also, you know, like Australia legalized in 2016, it shouldn't be that controversial anymore. Everyone should know of somebody who's using medical cannabis for something or another. I read in Australia, like there's been a huge uptake in specifically 
chronic pain, yeah. anxiety, and insomnia patients uh, using it. And now that there's more doctors already exported to Germany and that is going to probably be a market that continues to grow for Australia. So it's not going away and we need to just kind of start to, if hopefully sooner rather than later, flip the switch in our mind yeah. from drug to commodity. Yes, exactly. Exactly right. So then in terms of what you're doing and the work of the Cannabis Education Guild, um, what is, you know, what is uh, the guild and, and what, are, what are your aims? What are you actually wanting to, to do? Um, and more specifically, what are you doing in, in Mexico uh, if you're from Canada? Okay, so the Guild is an education platform. We have uh, done events, webinars, and we sell courses to educate um, industry on the commercial cannabis landscape, and most importantly, ethical supply chains. So in doing that, we're able to fund um, with 20% of our profits some organizations who are actually working in you know, rescuing victims of human trafficking donate that way and sort of bring the industry awareness through that type of social enterprise model. So we're a platform to educate, but also for social good to really help eradicate any kinds of slavery from the supply chain. And in Mexico, I originally came here because it's a, a really exciting time in the cannabis industry. It reminds me of Canada maybe six, five years ago. And also to get my yoga teacher training. So now I've been able to kind of combine those two interests and teach ganja yoga classes here. Un poco inglés, un poco español. It's very exciting. Muy bien. Muy bien. I oh, I wow, I lived in Spain for, for six years. So Okay. Um, so. We won't break out into Spanish at the moment. I don't know if my... Okay. okay. <laughs> Spain, in English. But yeah, so... Originally, I came um, partially for work and partially for uh, getting my yoga teacher training. Okay, great. So when it comes to the education, is this, uh, and it's on, on platform, so um, what kind of people groups are you targeting? Or is it just um, like students or businesses, government? What, um, how, does that, how does that work? So it's sort of everyone that we, our focus is definitely, you know, industry B2B. We have corporate partners uh, ranging from like pharmacies to uh, clinics that work with veterans to trade groups that, you know, um, sell the, the products to all the different retailers. And they take the courses as a, a training tool to understand commercial cannabis. A lot of industry has come from CPG from food and alcohol and tobacco, and they don't necessarily understand uh, cannabis other than what they remember from high school. So <laughs> getting them to understand it commercially, and yeah. then also having this opportunity while um, educating them to think of the greater, you know, picture and ethical supply chains, and you know, creating brands with purpose and and giving back. So uh, it's been an interesting journey for for the B two B space. We've also have had the privilege to educate different groups in government, mm -hmm. uh, specifically in Canada, of course, but across Asia. We were with uh, the Korean FDA, the Malaysian Ministry of Health, uh, people in the government in Thailand, Cambodia. So it was very exciting to have these conversations. And, you know, it's interesting that you said this topic is so controversial, where we used it as this like hot, sexy topic that people really want to get into because of the green rush. And then once we're there at the table, have the opportunity to then bring up, how do you feel about eradicating any kind of labor exploitation as you are creating legislation now? So let's think about that today. So we lead with the cannabis. Right. And then That's the Trojan horse approach. <laughs> it's really the, let's talk about modern slavery. And nobody wants to consume cannabis, this plant that's here to heal from a medical perspective and help make the planet more green with all the wonderful things hemp can do, regenerate soil, purify the air, like reusable fabrics, and then go and exploit it and consume cannabis that was cut by children. Like none of it adds up to the ethos of what this industry is about. And really those are the types of people that the industry is attracting as well. A lot of young people, entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. um, 
people who really, you know, went through a hard time to get cannabis as a medicine, they were self-medicating in the closet, you know, in university, maybe using it instead of ADD medication or antidepressants or sleeping pills. And, you know, we have this, like I said, unlearning to do about this plant and all of its potential. Well, I just feel like, you know, just um, the, this conversation that we're having really is just kind of scratching the surface um, on, on the potential use and, and on, on the one hand, the potential use and the growth of the industry and then all the issues that, that are going to come um, through that in terms of uh, addressing modern slavery. And uh, I think it's an important conversation, therefore, for a range of for types of organizations, companies, it's got application for healthcare providers, uh, pharmaceuticals and, and healthcare products, um, nutrition. Uh, it's got application for the apparel industry as well. Uh, you mentioned fuel, uh, I think one of our conversations. So uh, there's, a, and obviously the, the entire agriculture sector um, and, and how and what it chooses to, to plant and, and produce. And so, I think there's yeah there's a lot to consider, um, and it maybe even dovetails into the environmental how we can maybe solve some of our environmental concerns uh, through Absolutely. through this kind of product as well. Wow, well that um, yeah that's uh, really amazing, and uh, I want to just encourage everyone today look just to go on yeah just Google the Cannabis Education Guild, uh, look at the resources they've got, um, and, and see yeah what how that you can apply that that knowledge uh, to your own context. I'm wondering uh, at this point, um, yeah, in the webinar, if anyone has any questions um, they want to put forward uh, in the chat. I just put the website in the chat, but yes, if there's any questions, happy to answer them. And if not, and they come to you later, you know, feel free to write us a note on the website. Um, we've been lucky enough to engage in many different global webinars during COVID and receive some really wonderful feedback, even be able to virtually put together a group of international advisors who are helping us with the legislative piece in Canada. Um, they're all lawyers working in cannabis task force uh, as well as human rights. So we have someone from Thailand, Lesotho, Philippines, uh, the UK, the US, Canada, uh, France. And, you know, this, this letter, this, you know, proposal to the government is really important because we also want industry to support it. We don't just want it to be coming from the guilds. We want it to be, um, you know, a, a global effort where Canada can feel some pressure that industry is also behind this. Sure, great. So a question that I'd like to ask um, uh, my interviewees uh, is uh, if someone was to give you $10 million um, to invest uh, in your organization or, or project, um, how would you, where would you put it? Where would you spend $10 million at this point in time? That's a great question. <sighs> The artistic side of me is like a documentary, like a documentary will wake people up, like, you know, what we've seen with like animals and the food industry, just, you know, really like shatter everyone's perception that, oh, first of all, slavery doesn't happen in my country. That's something that happens somewhere else. Like, mm -hmm. no, it's in the products we buy. It's everywhere. Um, but also to really get people to flip the switch of cannabis as a drug to a commodity so that everyone's on board and that this idea of a conscious consumer movement happens quickly, uh, which I think a documentary could be a catalyst, but maybe the more business and practical sense would want to save the money and use it slowly um, and spread it out through education and campaigns in the industry and really develop with the right professionals, the type of ESG benchmarks so the type of standards that are needed for the sector, um, not only in, in human rights, but as it pertains to environment and governance issues as well, because it's, it's about best practices. But if, if we're not treating the land well, if we're not treating our employees well, of course, we're not thinking about where we're sourcing our raw biomass cannabis in Africa from. Like, you know, so if we don't even have those basic fundamentals in place i think you know having strong esg pillars or benchmarks 
will be really beneficial for creating best practices in the sector. So I would say, yeah, industry education and industry-led um, campaign would be important and waking up the, the conscious consumer. You know, there is already this movement happening, but I think it will grow. And I think that cannabis is such a unique product um, whether you're a lapsed consumer and going back to it, whether you're a new consumer, whether you've always had a drug dealer and now you're trying something legal, knowing where your product came from, knowing that it's transparent and what's on, you know, what's in there and who made it or who cut it, who produced it, I think is the way forward. And, and that is the future that we're moving into. Okay, great. So this would sort of be my buckets of where I would want to spend it all. <laughs> Well, maybe instead of at this point uh, pouring 10 million into a, a documentary, you could make a series of uh, YouTube uh, videos, animations, um, you know, given the, the volume of people that consume these days visually through different platforms, TikTok series, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that kind of thing as, as a way forward. Um, but yeah, obviously, yeah, it's very easy to, to, to spend that kind of money um just interesting just in terms of the you, you mentioned earlier that you uh you know give some profits to uh other organizations what kind of organizations uh, are these so ones that are already working in like um any type of anti-human trafficking work and rescuing victims so actually this this journey really started when I started volunteering with the Labor Protection Network in Thailand, yep. and they've been rescuing victims of modern slavery for 15 years, mostly in the seafood and agriculture sectors. And after cannabis was medically legalized in Thailand and hemp was removed from uh, the list of narcotics, the boom was starting and I just said to them, wow, if, if you guys don't understand what's happening and you don't get ahead of this, you're going to be rescuing people from cannabis in five, 10 years. And it was just this like long process to get them to understand and not see ganja in a baggie and see the commodity that it's becoming. Um, and so, yeah, we donated to them and worked with them and other organizations sure. to train them on the risks of uh, the cannabis industry and kind of the global landscape of what this is what a legal operator looks like. This is what a license looks like. Uh, so they understand it. To be very honest with you, um, I'm having a hard time finding that partner group in Mexico right now. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the largest, I will not say the name, uh, children labor protection organizations in the world, um, their head office in Mexico, we, we're interested at first in a webinar and starting to learn. And we do this for free. We want organizations to understand it and get ahead. And they came back to us with actually, we're too busy right now in Mexico focusing on potatoes, sugar, and tobacco. So we can't think about what's coming five years down the line. So that was kind of like a hard truth to accept. Um, but now we're also focused on Canada because like I mentioned, there's issues with migrant workers in uh, cultivation. Yep. So yeah, organizations that are specifically already on the front lines with human trafficking and labor exploitation. Wow. Well, you, um, well, I feel very inspired uh, by the work that you're doing and um, I thank you for the, your, your, thank you for the affirmation that you have unchained, but I'm really inspired by the, your commitment to this issue uh, and it's a, it's a global commitment uh, to educating people to, yeah, really uh, helping to, uh, helping people to unlearn the, you know, what, they, what they've come to understand uh, and to really think uh, much more broadly about, uh, yeah, the, what this actually, what this product is about and, and, and it's, uh, yeah, and where it sits in the market um, and uh, how, yeah, it's commodification for legal purposes um, whilst, uh, you know, significant. And what is also significant is also making sure that we attend to the risks that are involved uh, in, you know, in forced labour and, and child labour, especially um, with regards to the growing of this product. So, yeah, I want to, yes, uh, thank you uh, so much, Kelly, uh, for sharing with us um, on, on this platform. It's, it's late for you. So I want to thank you as you've dialed in from, from Mexico City. Really appreciate your insights today. Thank you so much for your slides. 
And uh, look, if you do have any questions uh, out there um, for myself or Kelly, uh, and you want to know more about this issue of modern slavery, uh, what you can do, uh, perhaps as an individual, as an individual consumer, uh, as you think about this, uh, this, this issue, and, and maybe there are products that you are interested in and you want to learn, know more about, yeah, what goes into these products and, and uh, you know, where they're being sourced and what they're being made. I'm sure that you know, Kelly would love to, to hear from you. I'd also, yeah, quite happy to talk with you. If you're an organization or business and you, and you know you need to do work in this area, um, particularly if you're an Australian organization, you, you know, and you need to look into this area more, uh, please be in touch as well because, yeah, unpacking, yeah, levels of complexity with modern slavery takes time and, and there's lots of nuances and, and, and areas that we need to attend to. I would just sort of want to share... Um, my screen, which will provide the details. I know that uh, Kelly provided her. Uh, let is just bring up. Just need to move that. Perfect. Thank you. That's okay. So you can just uh, you can email uh, Kelly there at Kelly at Cannabis Guild. Uh, educationguildsorry.com. You can also uh, do something you should be very familiar with, and that's putting in a scanning a QR code, and uh, you can uh, connect uh, with me. To, that connects you to Linktree, which has all my socials and connections. So very happy for you to continue the conversation um, with you at those two points. Yeah, we want to uh, thank you once again for joining us today, and uh, we wish you well uh, in uh, being a more responsible consumer and a more responsible organisation. So thank you. Thank you, Kelly, too. Thank you, Stephen. Great to be here with you. Yeah, you too. And you have a good night and look forward to catching up with you more uh, through the Commonwealth uh, 8.7 network. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you.